how is OCD different from uh, what are really common things that we see in youngsters? Um, OCD, in some ways, like the word depression, has entered um, the lay person's um, lexicon, and you will definitely hear people saying, oh, I'm so OCD, um, or this, oh, my child is so OCD. And usually, when they say that, what they really mean is OCPD, Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder, which is a different animal altogether. Um, it has to do with being in control and wanting things their way and other things that can often make people difficult to get along with. And we all know people like that in our in our lives, work and private lives. Um, but it's unfortunate that um, I really struggle when, when psychiatric terminology sort of gets used and misused in that way. You hear people often, I'm just going a little sideways here, but you'll often hear people say, oh, it was such a schizophrenic experience meaning it was sort of had very opposing or different kinds of things. But that is a really a terrible way to use that word. Um, it's a terrible disease, and it should be reserved for that kind of a problem and not really. For some reason, people take um, psychiatric terminology and, and um, use it in other kind of context, which I think is problematic. You don't ever hear somebody saying, oh, I'm so cancerous today. It's just sort of interesting. Okay. But there are a lot of things that kids do that are very obsessional, but are not OCD. So we're gonna talk through sort of what's normal, what is the normal course of, of certain things, and how is OCD different? What do we should we be thinking about when we are wondering about OCD? What other psychiatric illnesses should we be thinking about? And then what are the core components for treatment of, of OCD? Because it is extremely treatable, um, although it often goes untreated for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about next. All right, so this should sound very familiar to all of you who work with kids and, and, and teens, um, but there are a lot of things that kids of different ages do that are very ritualized, right? Toddlers need exact routines. If you don't do something in the right order, toddlers will get very unhappy. They may have to say, have you say good night to every animal in a certain order. They may have to get into the tub before the toys are in or get into the tub after the toys are in. And, and families will experience the kind of rigidity that comes with learning the word no and being able to realize that you can exert some control over your environment as you get to be a toddler and a, a young preschooler. Um, and so that's pretty common. For preschoolers, we, we see um, rituals definitely um, when they're with their families, um, either by themselves they may do things or when they're with their parents. And we maybe less so out in preschool or when they're with others. Um, but we tend to see it most of periods of transition. So going to bed, there is usually a bedtime ritual that they want to have. Certain books need to be read in a certain order. You can't skip any pages. As those of us with young children at one point in our lives learned early that you can't skip it once they, they know what to expect, things like that. And, and most families can, can uh, report those kinds of experiences that they have with their youngsters. Um, when you get to elementary school age, there are really kind of two categories that we think about. One is group play. And if you watch kids in elementary school playing, either at recess or at lunchtime or whatever, just at your home, um, there are a lot of rules to their play. And they are very rule bound. And if somebody doesn't follow the rules, they don't like that. And even things like the rhymes, um, you know, step on a crack, break your mother's back, things like that, that's probably so archaic. But um, those kinds of things. Or if you say the same thing as somebody else at the exact same time, and then you shout out jinx and you have to, you know, all those kinds of things. Those are really um, ritualized games that um, elementary school kids play. When they're by themselves, we also see um, certain kinds of rituals that kids will do. This is the age of collections and hobbies where they collect lots of things. You know, it might be, you know, calling cards or every place they go they need to get a magnet or things like that and they may have very um, strict rules about what they want to keep and why they have to keep it that way and what the display might look like and and parents and kids are happy to talk about these things um, by the time you get into junior or senior high school um, and kids are adolescents uh, we think about it a little bit differently but we definitely see fads and fascinations and focused interests so you know the kids who uh, 
are the goth kids in school and they dress in black and they wear black lipstick and they dye their hair black and they have lots of piercings. And there's a, there are parameters to what they're doing that um, they are following. It's, it's usually a group um, that has agreed upon what their look is. Uh, it might be a different group, but, but most of those kinds of things you'll see in their effort to be to individuate, they actually all kind of look the same because they've agreed upon what, like, the way to look is right then. Next. When we also think about, so those are kinds of rituals that are normal. These are superstitions, and, you know, most of us have engaged in them in the past, and many, maybe some of us still do, but there are different types, like good luck and bad luck objects, you know, a rabbit's foot or a horseshoe, things like that. There are, um, you know, I don't want to, think I did well on the exam because I don't want to jinx it. So don't anticipate a good event because something it could ruin the possibility of it happening. Um, safeguards from harm. You know, it's, it's I'm not going to do this because I don't want something bad to happen. Um, and wishes, you know, uh, first star, starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight, things like that. Birthday cake, you know, when you blow out the wishes. These are kind of superstitions that we all share in for the most part, and there's all kinds of cultural variations on them, but, but they exist and they are shared and they connect us to each other. Then there, there are superstitions that come dependent on where we are cognitively. So um, kids under about age seven don't really have a causal understanding of, of things. Um, so it's easy for them to have magical ideas about why things happen. Um, but those of us who have the cognitive capacity still are willing to suspend that belief in order to go along with some of those superstitions. Um, the other thing that we see in normal childhood uh, development is that there are certain settings where these superstitions are actually supported. Um, so we see some things around exam time. I'm going to sit in my lucky chair, got to use my lucky pencil. Not that anybody uses a pencil anymore, but, um, you know, I have to don't, in competitive sports, you know, the team, we're not going to cut our hair for the whole month to try to make it to the playoffs. Things like that, um, that actually can be very supported by the adults that are working with those youngsters. So it's a way to build community and um, build a shared experience. Next. So ritual, normal rituals and superstitions of childhood are common. They're reassuring. They're socially acceptable and often reinforced. And over time, they, they come out early and they tend to fade away. Doesn't mean we don't still wake up on the first day of every month and say rabbit, rabbit quietly to ourselves, but we can tolerate it a lot better than if we can't say it um, than we did when we were younger. Any questions or comments about that? Okay, next. All right, so if we think now, so if we hold that sort of normal in our head, and we think now about obsessive compulsive disorder, um, the important thing is first to start with some definitions. So an obsession is a persistent idea, thought, or impulse, or an image that is intrusive and inappropriate, and it causes anxiety or distress. It's basically a thought that you don't want to be thinking that's upsetting, but it sticks itself into your thoughts regardless, even if you don't want it to be there. The content is typically some sort of contamination, germs, doubts, did I turn off the light? I don't remember ordering things up, lining things up. Sometimes they're aggressive impulses or sexual impulses or images. Um, and the response is to try to ignore, suppress, or neutralize the obsession. We go to the next slide. So a compulsion is a repetitive behavior whose goal is to reduce the anxiety or distress. There is nothing about a compulsion that provides pleasure or gratification in and of itself. It is excessive and often has nothing to do 
with what it is designed, what our brain has decided should neutralize or prevent. So washing, we do see kids who have germ concerns, germ obsessions, wash their hands a lot. Checking, counting. Counting isn't going to fix much of anything, but we do it, we repeat things, and there are other kinds of behaviors that, that people can engage in. Um, but I think it's really important to remember that there's nothing inherently, there's nothing about the behavior that inherently brings any sort of pleasure or gratification. Okay, next. So obsessions and compulsions are uncommon, distressing. They tend to be quite time consuming. They can be socially isolating and they interfere with developmental tasks um, because they are time consuming and socially isolating, right? Um, developmental tasks have to do with where is your energy and who is it with. Um, and they tend to increase over the course of childhood into young adulthood and beyond. Next. So really big differences between the age of onset and trajectory, what the internal experience is, normal rituals reassure us, obsessions and compulsions are distress us. Normal rituals and superstitions facilitate social connection, whereas OCD isolates us. And we do the normal things out in public. It's okay because it's acceptable. But OCD lives in private. Um, I think, okay, so we go to the next slide, which has a lot on it. But the challenge is because so much of this lives internally, it can be very hard for families to really know what's going on. So these are things that I try to think about with families if they're noticing, um, uh, because because they they can be hard. Kids don't come forward and say, "Hey, I'm having this really unwanted intrusive thought," um, or "I'm doing this crazy thing. I have to count it. It's driving me nuts." That's just sort of not what happens. So we do want to think about what is the, the kid, what is the youngster doing? Are they repeating themselves? Are they having to do things over and over again? Is there a constant questioning or an excessive need for reassurance? Are simple tasks taking a really long time? Like even a basic homework assignment, are they erasing it a million times because it didn't look perfect? Are they late chronically, but is that because they have to go back and wash in the shower differently because um, they didn't get it right? Um, are they more concerned about little odds and ends and details? Do so they have catastrophic reactions if you rearrange their room one day? Um, can they not sleep well because they have intrusive thoughts? Are they staying up late because they have to do things in a certain way? Have they changed how they eat because they're concerned about germs? Um, daily life can often become very challenging, and you may see a youngster that just presents with increased irritability or a lot of indecisiveness. Um, and those can all be clues that maybe something in the OCD domains are, are going on. Next. When we think about what is it that a teacher might be noticing, um, these, these youngsters may line things up, check things, order things, or arrange things on their desk. They may spend all their time arranging their pencils and papers and not get to their assignments. Their backpacks may have to have things in a particular place. Their lockers may be um, similarly organized. They may have to get their assignments perfect, and they sometimes get um, into the situation where they don't turn anything in because it isn't perfect. And so from the teacher's end of it, they're just not doing their assignment. But from the youngster's perspective, they're working incredibly hard and they can't get it right. So you have this mismatch of um, perception about what's happening. Um, uh, we definitely see youngsters who, um, again, there's not so much handwriting as there used to be, but we would definitely see kids who would erase a piece of paper so many times because it didn't look right, that their paper would end up with little holes in it on some level. Um, do they have to read sentences or, or words or phrases over and over again to make it sound right? Does that slow them down if they have a heavy reading assignment? Um, again, incomplete assignments, even though the child was perfectly capable of doing them. Do they get frustrated or angry? Say they have to um, work in a group and other kids in the group aren't, aren't doing things the way they, or, or disrupting their routine in some way. Do they ask the same question over and over? Do they have to go to the bathroom a million times a day because they have to wash their hands again? Do they not want to touch anything at school? And that can be very problematic. Um, they might have to walk on the tiles in a certain way. Maybe that doesn't align with what the teacher wants them to do, and so they sometimes get in trouble. Are they tapping at their desk? <coughs> sometimes you'll see kids who, when they're sitting in their chair, they have to touch each shoulder blade to the back of the chair a certain number of times. And if somebody laughs at them or they get interrupted, they're going to start again, and they have to start their count again. Um, and all of those kinds of things can cause for a real 
really exhausting day for the youngster at school, but it cannot be obvious to anybody around them at school what exactly is going on. Uh, next slide. So when we see kids who have a lot of compulsions or obsessions, we definitely want to think about, is this youngster possibly on the spectrum? You know, kids who are on the autism spectrum can have rigidity and can have compulsive repetitive behavior. Um, so we want to be watching to see, is there anything else that would suggest an autism spectrum disorder, um, any difficulties in their social interactions or language or, or other kinds of things. Um, but also remember too that in OCD, the, the content of the compulsions and obsessions will change over time. They may wax and wane um, in severity and they may wax and wane in content. Um, that's not so true in autism uh, spectrum disorder. Those youngsters tend to just be very persistent in their rigidity. Certainly youngsters who have ADHD um, are going to be off task, um, but a child with OCD can look very inattentive if they're preoccupied with obsessions or needing to go do things. They don't finish their homework. They look like they're, they're incomplete assignments, things like that, can look like ADHD. So it's important to, to think about that. And then sometimes people think about PTSD. You know, when youngsters have a lot of sexual thoughts, sometimes people will think, well, maybe they were abused or overstimulated or exposed in some way. But um, sometimes this is OCD, and it can be very upsetting, and families can be very horrified by what they hear the youngsters thinking about. Um, and, and so it's something to, to think about that. If, if you're wondering about a PTSD, just want, I'd, I'd encourage you to think about, hmm, could this be some sort of sexual obsession or compulsion in some way? Next. Can I ask you a question about uh, substance-induced in, in, OCD symptoms, um, in particular, sometimes on high doses of stimulants, kids seem to get obsessive about things. Can you comment yeah, about that? Yeah, that's very different. That's a very different experience. That we definitely see kids who get um, overly focused from high dose stimulant or too much stimulant, um, overly focused, and they can begin to actually pick at themselves as well. And that's actually um, a psychotic or a pre-psychotic. There's a sensation of something on them that they're picking off. Um, but that over-focus and rigidity is not the same thing as OCD. It's not associated with the kind of um, unwanted intrusive thoughts um, that is qualitatively very different. It's, it's, that's an intoxication, like a cocaine intoxication, very similar. But so, they wouldn't, so it wouldn't, they wouldn't identify uh, any, upset, any disturbing thoughts. They would just have no, the, no. over but without being disturbed by it. Is that part Absolutely. of how you would sort that? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, they might have other metabolic, you know, heart rate and pulse changes. Their pupils might look different. You know, there would be other concomitant things that would need to be looked for if you think it's a stimulant, but it would present quite differently. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, from an epidemiologic standpoint, OCD is actually really common. Um, uh, Literature suggests between two and three percent of youngsters, and the reality is, although there's probably a little bit more awareness of OCD in adults, most OCD starts in youngsters. If you ask it, at least a third to a half of adults will report that their symptoms really started in childhood, but nobody knew, they didn't tell anybody, and it went unrecognized. Um, about almost half of, of people with childhood onset can experience remission. Boys are more likely to have a prepubertal onset and have a family history of OCD and Tourette's. Girls are more likely to have an onset during adolescence. Um, but the, among youth that are referred for OCD problems, the modal age of onset is seven, and the mean is, is 10. So it is a really early childhood disorder, um, just as uh, anxiety disorders are. So separation anxiety, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, and ADHD are. Um, and autism, of course, would be there even before. Um, so it does keep company with those other things that I mentioned in terms of what you should be just wondering about if, if you're if you're thinking about OCD. Next. Okay, so the challenge of treating OCD is very real. Um, for the youngster, if they are afraid something bad's going to happen and they have to do their rituals, then we have this huge barrier of how do we get them to stop doing their rituals 
and tolerate that they're going to be terrified. That's a real challenge. Um, we have to think about how do we remove both blame and shame. If they're having thoughts that are upsetting, it's very shameful for them. The idea that it's, um, we have to concretize the disease, right? So we think about reframing it from who you are to what you have. So often people will talk about OCD is a disease that you have and you have to you have to fight back against OCD. We actually, you know, you don't let the OCD bully you, you have to fight back. And so we, we in, in some ways almost anthropomorphize the disease so that we give kids something to push back, back against instead of always feeling overwhelmed by it. For the caregivers, we, we, you know, most parents try to relieve distress in their kids. It's a very lovely instinct. And so when OCD may first come out, parents are usually trying to accommodate it. Oh, it'll be okay. Oh, it's okay. You can take a longer shower. The most extreme example I've seen of, of accommodation, though, was um, an adolescent girl who um, had to, a lot of germ and contamination concerns and took a very lengthy shower, sometimes two plus hours shower in the morning before school, often using up all the hot water in the house. And the hot water heater was located, the switch for it was located behind the refrigerator. And the family's solution to this was to move the refrigerator so it was easier for them to reset the hot water heater. That's a kind of an extreme version of accommodating to minimize the distress that their youngster's feeling. But we kind of have to help caregivers go in the other direction without swinging too far, right? which is always hard. When you push on... When you think about electrons in an orbit, they're circling around, and when you push on one, you really just push it around in the orbit to the opposite side. To move it from one orbit to another orbit takes much more energy than to just push it 180 degrees. So it's the same kind of dilemma here, I think, for parents and caregivers, where we, we want them to, to not be accommodating, but we can't have them swing all to the other end where they just ignore it and say, you just got to stop doing that because that's crazy. Um, so we have to help them find this middle ground of supporting but not reinforcing. And I think that's very hard for a lot of families. And for the clinician, um, it's really important, and the data tells us this, that being optimistic and persistent really make a difference in the treatment outcomes. Okay, um, These can be very challenging cases because the kids get so distraught when we first try to introduce some, some things. Um, and uh, hang in there with them. Okay, next. So the main two components of treatment are CBT and SSRIs. Um, and often we will use both simultaneously. Um, many kids can just work in CBT and get better. Some kids can't tolerate the CBT work without a little bit of medication on board to reduce the distress. And some kids don't, for whatever reason, the kids in the family don't want to do CBT, and, and you can use SSRIs. And, and I have there the drugs that are approved for what ages by the FDA. Um, almost nobody uses clomipramine as a first-line drug. That would be highly unusual, um, since we have lots of much safer and easier to use uh, drugs. Um, clomipramine is, is not an SSRI. Sorry, that, that's confusing. It's um, a tricyclic. Um, and so that comes with other complications that we, we don't usually use as a first-line drug. So CBT is really the idea of the connection between your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. And we literally will draw that triangle with kids because they kids sometimes allow their thoughts, and adults too, sometimes we get confused between our thoughts and our feelings, um, and, and um, we react to a thought that may be incorrect. So you maybe have heard the, the idea of, you know, people have catastrophic thoughts that are just incorrect, like, oh, my God, I'm going to fail this exam. I fail everything I do. Well, you might fail this exam, but that's probably not an accurate statement. And so there's a lot of um, challenging the thoughts um, to try to create more correct thoughts. In CBT for OCD, um, we do that, but it has a slightly different emphasis. Part of what we want kids to do is tolerate exposure to whatever it is that makes them anxious and not let them do their compulsive ritual or whatever. Um, and that can be very hard. Um, the kind of exposures that I'm talking about 
Um, certainly we've done in, in adults, but you can do this in kids too, you know, people who are afraid of germs, you have to take your toothbrush and touch it to the toilet seat, or you have to lick the bottom of your shoe. Um, because the goal is not that you should never have anxiety or that there might not be a risk that you could get sick. Maybe that's a risk. Life is filled with risks. But the idea that you can tolerate that is the goal. Um, so it's not that you're not going to be anxious. It's just that you can survive feeling anxious. And so we try to create opportunities for youngsters to tolerate it and realize that they can survive. And that gets into this um, pushback on the bully of OCD, that you can't distress me that much anymore. Um, and that's often combined with very basic relaxation techniques, deep breathing, visualization, things like that. Um, and we start with one or two specific behaviors and then begin to accumulate success and we begin to build to other ones. And that can take 10 to 20 sessions um, uh, uh, of working. It's really important that parents understand the work that's being done because they're going to need to reinforce it at home. So parents are very much part of the treatment um, so that they can be learning the techniques and learning when to push, when to give up, things like that. Um, sometimes what happens is parents get really excited and they start to generalize too early and then there's a big setback. And that's what I mean about pe uh, persistence and optimism for the clinician is it takes a, it takes a lot of patience to, to get these families through. Next. Could you talk a little bit more about your choice of medicines, if you wouldn't mind? Um, you uh, know, I like think... whether you have a preference for one or another, or dosing, no. or how to deal with it? Yeah, I, I don't really. I mean, fluoxetine and sertraline are easier because they're once a day. Fluvoxamine, Luvox, um, people don't use as much just because it's a twice a day drug, but it's an excellent drug. Um, so I think there are different reasons why people might pick fluoxetine or sertraline. Fluoxetine has a longer half-life, which can be good if you're worried about adherence. If they get side effects, it's not so good. Sertraline has a shorter half-life, so it kind of has the opposite pros and cons. Um, sometimes I'll ask if anybody else has ever been on any of the medication in the family, either for anxiety or depression or OCD. If they've had a good response to one, I'll probably start with that one, both because there may be a genetic reason why they had a good response, and this kid may be able to maximize that, but also because they feel more positively <laughs> about that medication, and vice versa. If they've had a negative experience, I, I will try to avoid that one. And when when would you pick clomipramine? How, what, would, um, I, what would have had to happen yeah, before yeah, you? Yeah, so I don't ever use clomipramine as a single drug uh, uh, initially. Um, it can be very helpful with some kids that are really struggling, either because they get into bad side effects with SSRIs, and you can use it in combination. You just have to watch your your dosing. Um, uh, or there are kids who. Um, uh, will end up on it only, but that's after, th those kids should be seen by a child psychiatrist because that's a much more complex, that's like second, third tier interventions. Um, if people are not familiar with, um, there's a wonderful book called Pediatric Psychopharmacology for Primary Care. Um, that, oh, yeah. That American it's Academy beautiful. of Pediatrics um, just put out, it's the second edition. Yeah. Full disclosure, my husband wrote it and I'm an editor, but um, it is a very useful um, it's a small paperback, um, you can get it on Amazon, but it has all of the kind of guidelines and, and how to think about psychotropic medication in kids and um, what you need to know and, and what you don't need to know. Um, if anybody's interested, I think it's, a, it's actually a really useful guide, um, if that's okay that I said that, Barbara. Of course, we, we're okay. delighted that you said that. <laughs> okay. How about, do you, do you ever feel that genetic Testing uh, the way people are doing now for for it when they're choosing big league like antipsychotics and so forth. Does genetic testing ever help guide a choice of medicine for a condition like this? No, there's no data that suggests any genetic testing is really very relevant. We don't know enough yes. to use it. It's expensive. I think it's um, a waste of, of a family's money, um, and it is not helpful. We are not knowledgeable enough yet. Um, to actually use that information in meaningful ways. And any clinician I feel, this is my personal opinion, is that if a clinician is recommending that, the family might want to get a second opinion. Right. <laughs> well, we agree. I, I have to say, though, that people come already having done it. Uh, yeah. In, in the problem, and that's very hard because 
it, they think it's data and it's not data. You know, they think it has meaning and, and we've set them up for that. And I think that's very challenging and unfortunate. Yeah. Hopefully at some point we will be able to do it, but we just are not there yet in any aspect of psychiatry. Um, you know, a lot of like there, there's sometimes it, there can be some in, instances where we want to find out if somebody is a fast or a slow metabolizer. Sometimes people will think about that, but you know, you can usually tell that clinically, right? Um, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, terrible side effects on really, really low doses hmm, probably aren't metabolizing very quickly. You know, so I think yeah. that there are um, occasionally situations where it would be meaningful, but I would always say that should be done in consultation with a, with a specialist. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, so talking with families, um, and this is the last slide, but um, I think sometimes parents are very surprised and often upset to hear what it is that their youngsters are worried about and will often try to um, understand it. And the thing about OCD is that it's irrational. You know, it's, it's not anything that makes any sense. And so it's just a disease and the symptoms take this wacky form and families shouldn't worry about what does it mean that my youngster is having sexual images and intrusive thoughts. You know, are they going to become a rapist or something like that? I, I, it's just, it's just as, so we have to be prepared for how families will hear this and how come they didn't know. So families may also feel guilty that they didn't realize this was going on. So there's a lot of things that we're going to need to be prepared to do to support youngsters. It is highly treatable, really, really robustly treatable, but it is a chronic illness. And, and often what you'll see are people get better, but during times of stress, um, they really have to prepare for change and transitions because they may have an increase in their symptoms. And sometimes people can get a booster bunch of CBT sessions or go back on meds for a little while or things like that. So it can be important and sometimes it's helpful to talk with school about what kind of things should the youngster be allowed to do as they're working towards getting better and what, where can the limits be set. Um, we don't want to facilitate abnormal illness behavior by not setting any limits by just saying, oh, a patient has a disease, person has a disease, nothing we can do about it. Um, so we want to create this supportive environment that acknowledges that, suff that youngsters suffering, but to not let the OCD be in charge. Um, and so just being sensitive to how they're doing on any given day and how their progress is making and trying to keep the family routine as normal as possible while being aware of the natural tendency of, of caring parents to want to accommodate and minimize distress. So that's the, that's all I was going to say. Well, that, it, it's very helpful. Um, when you say it's highly treatable, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also like illness, I yes. assume you mean that the symptoms can be brought under control. Um, uh, do you have any sort of, can you give us any statistics on, like, is it, like most people can have their yeah, symptoms under control. Yeah, most people can get their symptoms under control. control. And, some, and, and many, many will have complete remission. But it is a chronic illness in the sense that, um, you know, people who have had two, three episodes of depression, they have chronic illness of, of recurrent major depression. But when they're not having an episode, they're fine. But they still have a chronic illness. So people who may have um, other kinds of chronic illnesses, not just psychiatric but medical, may have periods of wellness but they still have the illness. So that in the sense that you need to be, rem you need to remember that this is the, the way you may present under stress. So people, patients will talk about, you know, I've noticed I'm under a lot more stress and I've noticed I've started counting things again or, or things like that. Um, and, and just that self-awareness, like, oh, it's sneaking back into my normal daily living. I need to remind myself how to, how to check it. Um, and that's where I think CBT is really helpful because it's skills that, that you own once you learn them. And you can use them repeatedly. And so you can use them preventive, pro prophylactically, too. You know, you're coming into a period of stress. Say this transition from high school to college for youngsters is very stressful. So that may be a time to do a little booster sessions. How am I going to get myself organized? What am I going to notice? What should I watch for? Things like that. Mm -hmm. Emily, you, you want to speak a little bit to the company that OCD keeps and the ADHD um, uh, tick uh, trilogy that uh, so we there see in some. Some, there's there's a separate genetic um, 
association for some youngsters who have ADHD that it keeps company with OCD and Tourette's. It's not the majority of ADHD youngsters, but we definitely see families where, for example, dad will have Tourette's, mom has OCD, and the child has ADHD. It's a very common pattern. Um, most kids with ADHD obviously are more likely to have parents with ADHD than, than those other disorders, but um, there is a sub group who, um, of kids with OCD that seems to keep company with Tourette's and ADHD. Um, the treatment is the same, um, but it is something just to be aware of. Yeah, it's sometimes hard to balance out that, uh, you know, those three components, like the more you treat the ADHD and they worry and they focus more and, and getting the right balance is and getting the order in which you treat it. Yeah, is, I would uh, say that treating somebody's ADHD to improve their focus does not increase their OC symptoms because they're not the, they're not content similar. So we don't see they, that. They, 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 anxiety though. We, we, they can have other exactly. kinds of anxiety, but it doesn't increase OCD symptoms. It can increase not tics. Okay. They have Tourette's and that you have to sort of decide what is more impairing for any given youngster. In general, we tend to ignore tics as much as we can for as long as we can, um, right. Right. unless they're really noisy or, or very big in some way that's problematic. Right, right. And uh, any comment about the, uh, you know, the post-streptococcal uh, infectious autoimmune yeah. uh, theory of um, all this? You know, I, that has never really panned out so to speak. Um, uh, there's no, it, it, it's not really clear. Sue Sweeto has been working on this for probably 25 years at NIH and yep. there's no more data now than there was 20 years ago to suggest that that is um, a thing. And it's tricky because we as humans like to make associations. Families can um, easily, you know, OCD is common, so is strep throat. So it can be very challenging, I think, to to, to see um, what what that is. But the literature has not really robustly supported that. So we tend not to talk about it too much anymore. Yeah, yeah. You think oh, the patients won't let us not talk about it. Yeah, uh, they, they come I think in, we have to be honest. Look. Literature is not there to really move it forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's always we wonder whether there's a, a it's a rare thing that actually happens or it, it it doesn't happen at all. That that's the it's certainly not very common if if at all kind of thing. Um, yeah. Um, how often do you see an abrupt onset though? So one of the things that makes the pandas sort of feel as though it might be true is the very abrupt onset of a kid who has apparently yeah. no symptoms of before and now suddenly they do. Yeah, um, we definitely see it. I, I think it's always tricky to know whether it's abrupt onset or parents just noticed. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and it just crossed the threshold for them to notice. Maybe that's a marker that the child is just more distressed now. It's possible that it had a very acute onset. That doesn't necessarily mean it's related to pandas. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, this has been very helpful. Um, Let's go, off. Go, go ahead. Sp speak a little louder, please. Sure. Um, go ahead. My question has to do with um, resources available in the community for providers who, who provide cognitive behavioral therapy. Is there is there a way in which I can understand that better or tap into that? Because right now I'm kind of finding a situation where there's very few providers out there. And the biggest issue is that I don't know which ones of them would be worthy of the referral uh, for my population. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge problem. Um, there is um, a website. I'm trying to, um, yeah. there's the association. Psychology no. Today. No, 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 no better one. No, no. Uh -huh. to that one. There's a, there's a CBD. Uh, yeah, it's it's, the, it's yeah. ABCT Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapy. So it's just www.abct.org, uh -huh. and you can um, I believe you can 
punch in a zip code and it will tell you, um, it will give you a list. Yeah, if you go to find help, um, you can punch in a zip code and, and how, how many mile radius and what kind of discipline and what kind of insurance and you, it'll find you a certified CBT clinician. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure.